everyone this is Neil Frankel with Wealth Resources Group and this is the 2014 State of the Market State of the Economy um, address thank you very much for attending I'm sorry that you couldn't come to the client event itself but I'm glad you're listening in and today I'll spend about 30 minutes I'm gonna give you a quick update of what's going on in the economy and in the market and obviously when we talk about the economy we draw on work done by economists and we all know why God created economists to make weather people weathermen look good anyway so the point is that I won't be able to predict exactly what's going to happen in the stock market that's impossible to do but we what the goal is today is to look at the forces that are at play in the market and in the economy to try to get a sense of what we can expect hopefully a sense of what we can expect and uh, to understand events as they unfold in the within the context that they should be understood now you might be surprised by some of the things that I'm going to talk about I know that every time I prepare one of these talks I personally get very surprised by what I learn so I'm going to encourage you to take notes and you can then email me questions with some of the materials that we go through and uh, yeah I, I encourage you to make this an interactive event now in order to really <clears throat> uh, have financial security obviously you need to understand perspective you, you've got to understand what's going on in the financial realm of, of the stock market and the economy but also if you don't take a good look at your own situation um, and safeguard your financial situation with your own personal uh, decisions then it's going to be very difficult no matter what happens with the economy and the stock market and I want to show you a little anecdote that illustrates that point So you can see that it's very important we don't want you to have any unexpected financial problems the way to make sure that you safeguard yourself against that problem is to look at your own situation and I'll give you an opportunity to do that toward the end of the workshop today okay so the first graph we're looking at is the S&P 500 index at different points so we can see that from 1996 through 2000 the stock market did really well it, it, it gained more than a hundred percent and then unfortunately when everyone thought that the market couldn't go down it did and it dropped 49 percent through October 9th of 2002 and that was about the time where people decided the market would never come back the stock market was done and they sold out and stayed out of the market which was a mistake because the market then went up over a hundred percent through October 9th of 2007 <clears throat> now that exactly coincides with the time when there was the financial crisis where the market dropped 57 percent and again right around here this is where people decided oh it was a mistake to get back in I'm gonna stay out and never get back into the stock market that's been a mistake too because the market went up over hundred and seventy three percent since the low point which was in uh, which looks like it was in March of 2009 so what's important to understand is that obviously we live in very volatile times the market is very volatile however it's important to understand that decade or that period of time in proper perspective 
because that was one of the worst time periods ever in recorded history and to expect that we'd go through that kind of turmoil again is probably unrealistic although it obviously could happen but even with things as bad as they were uh, the markets did recover obviously no guarantee of future results now unfortunately unfortunately it actually gets worse than that this shows the year by year results and as you can see it gets worse for investors because it shows the year by year results from 1980 through 2012 through 2013 excuse me and we can see that most of the years the market did pretty well there were some years where the market did not do well but most years the market was was pretty good however th it was difficult because there were th these red lines these red uh, points show the worst dips during the market so for example in 1987 we had the mar market crash and the market dropped 34 percent during the year even though we can see here the market was up two percent for the year likewise in 2009 the market was up 23 percent but during the year the market dropped 28 percent so even in good markets the stock market during the year will have some pretty nasty shakeouts and that's terrible it's difficult and even in uptrending markets it's something that is un unavoidable and the average the average drop in the market uh, over this period of time was 14.4 percent which again very difficult but something that long-term equity investors unfortunately have to uh, be able to tolerate. Now there's a couple of ways that we can help uh, clients uh, let's say tolerate that or or perhaps maybe mitigate some of that risk but the, the reality is that at the end of the day the only way to uh, yeah the only way you can guarantee against any risk is to not invest in equity markets. Now one of the things that drives the stock market is PE. What exactly is PE? That's basically the price compared to the earnings. So if you have a stock that's going at hundred dollars a share and the company is earning fifty dollars a share, that's not the dividends but it's the earnings. If it's earning fifty dollars a share the price, the PE ratio is two. That means it takes two years for the stock <clears throat> to pay for itself by its earnings. If you have a stock that's going for hundred dollars a share and it's earning only five dollars a share the PE ratio is 20 so obviously that's a lot more expensive and that means there's more risk the higher the PE it takes with with the second example it, it takes 20 years for the PE for this for the earnings to pay for the stock itself so it's a lot more uh, risk there why does the PE ratio change basically as people are more optimistic um, the PE ratio expands and as people are more uh, pessimistic the PE ratio drops so the question of course that you're asking is are stocks expensive today where are the PE ratios this chart shows the average PE uh, over the last 20 years and where the PE ratio is today for different stocks so some stocks are very expensive compared to their historical averages the for small and mid cap stocks uh, value and blend and even some growth the P the current P E ratio is above its 20-year average but on the other hand some stocks are not uh, high relative to their average P E ratio you can see that the, those uh, types of stocks that are in the yellow boxes the large cap blend and growth most notably uh, are trading at lower than their average PE ratio. So basically the message here is that when pe people say that stocks are expensive, historically speaking, you've got to look a little bit deeper. The PE ratio isn't so simple. The, the, you, you've got to look at the different segments in the market. Now, the most important driver of PE ratio is, are earnings. So the question is what's happened to earnings? You can see that since 2001, earnings, corporate earnings have re really went up 
and hit a high point in the second quarter of 2007, hitting $24.06. That was the earnings per share of the S&P 500. Unfortunately, 2008 earnings basically disappeared, and uh, we we all know. In fact, the average S&P 500 stock lost nine cents a share in 2008. So we all know what happened to the stock prices during that time. But what's fascinating, if you ask me, is that earnings since the recession have come back and then some earnings are now higher than they were prior to the recession. And to me, it is really amazing that stocks have done so well so quickly. Uh, I, I never would have expected after such a significant drop back in 2008 for the Ameri you know, the United States uh, business community to do so well so quickly. But it has. So that's, I think, noteworthy. Um, how are corporations generating those profits? We can see that profit margins are at an all-time high. How are they doing it? Well, they're investing in technology. Also, uh, the S&P 500 companies, largest companies in the United States and in the world for that matter, they've really cut down on debt. So they have um, big investment in technology, very little debt. They're not hiring a lot of people. So that's how they've grown. And basically, to, to summarize, they've cut their costs down to the bone. In order for profits to continue to grow, the consensus is that they're going to have to see revenue increases. That means they're going to have to do more sales, uh, invest a little bit heavier, and that's probably going to result in hiring. Companies now are sitting on over a trillion, $1.3 trillion in cash to invest. They haven't done so for, because of uncertainty. And unfortunately, well, for whatever reason, in order for companies to grow their profits going forward, they can't cut costs anymore. They're going to have to um, invest. That's going to result in stimulation for the economy. Now, how strong is the economy? Well, we can see that in, during the last recession, we lost almost 9 million jobs. That's a lot of jobs. But then, since the recovery started, we've gained back about 8.1 million. So we're still not to pre-recession levels in terms of economy. And we're sitting at a 7% unemployment rate which is, by historical standards, high. It was much higher, but it's come down, but it's high still. Now, <clears throat> some people say that the unemployment rate is artificially low, that really there's a lot more people. The unemployment rate should be much higher because a lot of people have simply stopped looking for work. Now, that's true. A lot of people have stopped looking for work. But according to the Wall Street Journal, most of the people who stopped looking for work did so because they retired. They aged out of the uh, worker pool. And if anything, we're probably going to see, because of demographics, aging demographics, we're going to see more and more people age out of the economy to the point where we're going to see more and more companies, in my opinion, you know, I don't like to predict the future, but I, I feel safe in making this prediction that we're going to see more and more companies aggressively look to hire people in certain areas, that it's going to be harder to find replacement workers rather than having a lot of a big pool of people who are unemployed to draw from. Now, this unemployment figure also is somewhat misleading because while across the board we have a 7% uh, unemployment rate, if you have a bachelor's degree or greater, the unemployment rate is 3%. So what, what that means to me is that unemployment, well, the, the people, if you have a bachelor's degree, you're making more money and it's much easier to find a job. So again, oversimplification uh, I think does us a disservice. We've got to just drill a little bit deeper to see really what's going on in our economy. Now, looking further into the economy, by the way, I met a man, gosh, a couple weeks ago who was basically a walking economy. He had, uh, his hair was in a recession, his stomach was suffering from severe inflation, and as a result he was in a depression. Well, I'm not sure if you like that joke or not, but let's get going back into the thing here. <clears throat> we can see that, again, the recession that 
ended in 2009 was severe, much more severe than previous recessions. And so far, the recovery has been muted. It hasn't been, it hasn't popped. The economy hasn't popped. That's one reason why some economists feel that the, re the, the recovery has some ways to go because it really hasn't uh, been fully developed yet. Now, how is the economy measured? It's measured by our GDP, gross domestic product. And that's another word for consumption. Now, consumption is um, who, who, who are the greatest consumers in our economy? Basically, as we can see, the private individual consumes 68.2% of the overall production. Government's important, and uh, uh, corporate spending is also important, but by far the most important component of our GDP are the individual consumers. So how well are consumers doing? Well, <clears throat> we can see over here, this is a balance sheet, and it shows how strong the individual uh, consumer is. So <clears throat> this first chart or, or bar on the right shows our debts compared to our liabilities. And we can see that the balance sheet looks pretty good because investors have very little debt compared to their overall assets. And the debt that we do have, most of that is in mortgages. So very little consumer debt, and that's a good thing. Next, we can see that in the recession, our uh, net worth dropped from 83 trillion to 69 trillion. But at this point, we're above the pre recession levels. We're at 90 trillion dollars. So we, consumers have really come on strong. Now, how have they done that? Number one, debt service ratio is very low because interest because we have less debt and because the debt that we have is relatively inexpensive because interest rates are so low we spend a lot less money on paying for our debt and that has generated a very strong consumer let's keep going and look at some of the leading indicators these are four indicators that economists rely on to try to get a sense of which way the economy is going in the future and we can see the first thing vehicle sales they've been going up which you know <clears throat> Purchasing an automobile is a, uh, a big ticket item, and that's been historically a good leading indicator. And uh, it's, you know, people are buying more and more cars. In terms of housing, it's also been a good sign because uh, after the recession, people just basically stopped buying houses. We can see that uh, that's been in a good recovery mode as well. In terms of manufacturing and inventories, that's been low. That has not really recovered, and that coincides with the issue of companies that haven't really beefed up and ramped up their their employment and their hiring. So that's that, that's been a drag on the economy. But companies have been spending more money on capital goods, investing there. So that's keeping helping them keep their costs low. Again, we said earlier that companies are just going to have to spend money on hiring at this level, at this stage of the economy, in order for them to grow their profits. The banking system is also looking, quite frankly, very good. Uh, lending standards for mortgages have increased, have improved. So it used to be that all you had to do was fog a mirror in order to uh, get a loan. Now the banks have a higher standard in order to make a loan to you. Mortgage originations, they dropped, obviously. Banks just stopped making loans, and they've slowly increased the amount of activity where they're making more loans to people. So that's been a, a help to push the economy forward. In terms of delinquencies, well, uh, mortgages, residential mortgages, oops, <clears throat> we'll come back to that in a minute. Mortgages, residential mortgages still have an 8.6% delinquency rate, which is pretty high. And if interest rates go up, that's going to go up further. Um, it's headed in the right direction, but it's a wild card. We really don't know what's going to happen with foreclosures. However, on consumer debt and business debt, the delinquency rate is lower than it was prior to the recession. So again, that shows a stronger economy. And common equity is a percentage of total assets. This tells you how strong banks are. Basically, the bank balance sheets 
are stronger than they have been for over 75 years. So the banking system is pretty good. Now let's take a little deeper look at housing. <clears throat> What's cool about housing is that the affordable index, the affordability index, is at an all-time low, meaning houses are basically more affordable than they ever have been. On top of that, the inventory is very low. So that would indicate that um, housing, although obviously no guarantee, that housing uh, should continue to be a net supporter of the economy and the expansion. Now we've looked at the consumers, we've looked at corporations, and we looked at housing and banking. Let's take a look at the government. Oops, forgot about my flower-mouthed puppy. Let's look at the government now, because things aren't so roses. Well, this chart on the left, it shows total spending. And 50% of the spending is mandated by law. And the other 50% is made up of military spending and, non -dis and, and discretionary spending. <clears throat> Over here, we can see uh, where the revenue is coming from. And unfortunately, almost 20% of the money that we spend is we don't bring in. So that means the government has to borrow that money. As a result of that, our deficit went way up when we borrowed a lot of money during the recession. <clears throat> and it, it is absolutely true that we did borrow a lot, but we can see here that it's come way down. The deficit has really come down on an annual basis. And it looks like it's it's going to flatten out. <clears throat> it looks that way. And um, with respect to our accumulated debt, that also is high. It, it ballooned up during the last recession, but it looks like it's been stabilized as well. Now, the thing about this is that it, we really don't know. This is the part with the economists that, you know, th there's so many variables that it's very difficult to predict. If interest rates go up, probably the deficit and the, and the accumulated debt will also go up. It's going to cost the government a lot more money to service that debt. But there's also some good news, believe it or not. There's some things that we can't really um, predict. It's, it's, it's impossible to really know what's going to happen. And one of those things, there's wild cards. And one of those things uh, is energy. Now, the United States is predicted to be the number one oil producer by 2015. So when that happens, a lot of other things happen. Number one, uh, when oil is, is cheaper, um, more business gets done. Uh, that means more jobs, and that means more revenue, more taxable income. And it could be that the government takes that extra money and spends it, of course. That, that, that's, that would, that's one possibility. On the other hand, it's not unreasonable to hope that maybe the government will take those excess revenues and pay down the debt. I don't know. I don't think it's highly likely, but I do think it's possible. And as a result of that, I, I don't know that we're headed for certain gloom and doom like some people who sell newspapers want us to believe. <clears throat> also, this is interesting. This came out just a couple days ago. Uh, because basically energy is so abundant in the United States, people are shifting factories from Asia back over to the US, which is astounding. So what does that do for our employment figures? What does that do for our revenue figures? What does that do for tax revenues? These are things that uh, I, I don't know that have been fully priced into the market. And we, we certainly don't know how they're going to play out at the end of the day. But they are significant. And it, it could be potentially big surprise to the upside. Oil has a huge impact on the economy. As you can see, you know, the economy, excuse me, in, 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 in 2008, oil cost our GDP 3.7%. It took, us, took that off of our GDP. Now, it's 2.3%. So it's much lower of a drag. And the reason for that, of course, is because our imports have gone way down and hopefully will be an energy exporter at some point. So the point is that there's a potential for oil to actually be a big net supporter 
uh, and, and act as a, a huge wind to our sales in our economy. Now, some people ask, why haven't we had a lot of inflation? The government absolutely printed up a lot of money during the recession. There's no question about that. Why wasn't there a lot of uh, uh, inflation? Well, one reason is, is because a lot of the money that was printed up stayed at those banks and re required reserves that wasn't released into the economy. And uh, as a result of that, inflation really never appeared. That's one of the reasons why gold suffered significant declines in 2013. Gold is a hedge against inflation. Inflation hasn't really shown itself yet. We don't know what the future is going to be. But as a result of that, um, the and, and as a result of the fact that the excess dollars didn't really circulate that much, there obviously was a lot of government spending. And that's you'd think that would be inflationary. But also, there was a lot of dollars that stayed in the banking systems. And as a result of that, we didn't have a lot of inflation, at least not yet. Now, looking forward, you can see that the United States and Japan and also South Korea, very urbanized countries. And as a result of that, the GDP is very high. China and India are on a path to greater urbanization. And this shows that as urbanization increases and hits critical mass, the GDP goes way up. We can see that India and China are far from mature along that process. So it's reasonable to expect that the, the, the developing countries will continue to grow and be net additive to the world economy. Global story. Bonds and stocks. <clears throat> okay, well, this is interesting. The first blue arrow shows that even though the market has done really well for the past five years, uh, 2013 was the first year where more money was added to the stock market than was taken out of it the first year and we can see here again basically the same thing that more money has flowed into the market than the stock market and if so you can see that if that continues um, that will be very helpful to equity investors what lies ahead for 2014 obviously no one knows but the economy that we're operating in has a low and rising inflation, if maybe low and, and stable inflation. And we can't guarantee the future, but historically, when we've had an economy like that, that's been very good for equities and good for commodities. Not good for cash, not good for bonds. So for that reason, that's another reason why I'm pretty uh, bullish long term for equities and um, to a lesser extent, commodities. I'm not a huge fan of investing in commodities, but historically speaking, during periods that we're going through, it's been a good period. Now, how should we approach 2014? Well, I don't recommend that you look at any one year. You can see from this first blue arrow that in any one year, the stock market could do as well as gain a half, 50, 51% or lose 37%. And if you focus on what the one-year returns are going to be, you'll end up in a therapist's office. Not a good tone. But if you look at a five-year history, there's actually never been a five-year history or period when stocks, a 50% uh, portfolio of stocks and 50% bonds didn't actually make money. So my recommendation is instead of thinking about your portfolio, what's it going to do this year? There, you know, as bullish as we've seen the story to be, uh, it's really impossible to know. I mean, who would have thought last year, with the government default and the running out of money and the gridlock, the political gridlock, that the market would do as well as it did? But it did do well. So there's really no telling in any one year what it's going to do. And my suggestion is to forget about what the market's going to do. Instead, think about your own situation and what your needs are over the next five years and invest five or ten years or twenty and invest thinking about that instead of worrying about any one year because quite frankly we just don't know what to expect so in summary <clears throat> the economy looks very strong it's expanding at rates uh, that are accelerating the consumers are doing well interest rates are still low inflation is low 
corporations are also doing well. They're sitting on a lot of cash, $1.3 trillion. They've got to invest. That's probably going to lead to lower unemployment levels. We're going to see more investment probably. The stimulus is a problem. The government has reduced stimulus, and we're going to see stimulus taper off. That is having unintended consequences. And for reasons that I don't have time to explain, that was, that's what was behind some of the market declines um, in the um, middle of January of 2014. And it's, but it's basically been negative for the international scene, the uh, um, uh, emerging markets, rather than anything else. And the emerging markets then spill over to the domestic markets. But the stimulus, it's a big part of the world economy, not just the American economy. And the reduction in stimulus, uh, no one really knows. Although long term, I believe that it will be very good for our country. Housing looks great. We've seen that the affordability of housing is, is very strong. And um, um, there's very little inventory. So it looks pretty good for housing. I think that's going to be a strong positive for our economy. A little problem with international conflicts. If there's a military conflict between China and Japan or in the Middle East, obviously that's crazy and it could derail the world economy. Also, politics, huge problem. Um, we saw in 2013 that when the uh, uh, there was political gridlock uh, and Washington basically stopped functioning, that was a net negative for the market, and that really hurt our uh, hurt hurt investors. So, if the the problem with politics is if interest rates go up. That means more of the money that the government has will have to be spent toward paying debt service. And that means there'll be less money to play around with for other programs. And that means there'll probably be more conflicts. Um, so, and, and if there's more conflict, that means there's potentially more gridlock. So I think that's a problem, and I'm concerned about that. Overconfidence, quite frankly, one of the reasons uh, the stock market will decline as if there are it, it, the stock market needs a wall of worry to grow and if everyone is super confident in the stock market that sets it up for huge declines and that's also partly what um, has impacted the market in the middle of January so as we can see there are pros and cons and there's some things that we just don't really know and we don't really know the weight of each of these individual um, factors and forces on the economy. So what are the best practices, the best strategy? Number one, let's be clear about what your needs are. Okay? What are your needs for the short term, mid term, and long term? What are you trying to achieve? Let's look at the alternatives. The beautiful thing about working with an independent fiduciary certified financial planner is that we have to give you objective advice that's based on your needs, not on what was going to make us the most money. So there are many alternatives, not just investments that I uh, manage. And my ob obligation to my clients is to look at all the alternatives and make the best suggestion that I can come up with for you. And then finally, vigilance, to make sure that uh, whatever uh, uh, we're plan we come up with uh, to make sure that we have accountability. We watch it and make sure that we're on track. We make sure that if your situation changes, we, if we tweak, if we need to tweak your program, we do. See, it's not about making the most money. It's about achieving your financial goals. The only way to do that is to be aware of what your goals are, have a plan that, will, that we can execute that will achieve your goals, and then monitor that to make sure that we're on track both as your goals change and as the world economy shifts as well. So I just want to use the few remaining moments we have as a shameless plug for myself. I want to encourage you, if you're already a client, thank you very much for entrusting your financial future in my firm and me. And if you're not, I would encourage you to consider talking with me about potentially working together. 
because we have this seven point client delight plan and it starts off with paying attention as I mentioned paying attention to your situation making sure that I fully understand it and secondarily paying attention to what's going on in the world economy to make sure that the plan that we put in place for you several years ago or last week or whenever it was still makes sense I have a very flat hierarchy if you have an administrative question I have my main office manager who handles all those problems and if he can't I will and if you have a financial issue the only person you're going to talk to is me so uh, people clients enjoy that knowing that they can get right to the source and they don't have to go through a, a long uh, bureaucracy of getting the solutions to their problems we have a 15 point quality control system meaning take painstaking efforts to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks now we're not perfect so if there's a mistake we correct it number one and number two we put systems in place to make sure that 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 problem never gets repeated as as, as much as we possibly can number four ninety percent of our clients are referred to us and ninety eight percent of the people who work with us stay with us so that's a very important benefit meaning that we have a vested interest in really delivering world-class service to you the sixth point is that I do write for Forbes Wall Street Journal Business Insider Yahoo Huffington US News and World and the benefit to my clients is that I'm I've been writing for about 12 years and that forces me to stay on top of what's going on in the economy what's going on in the world and that translates into helping me be a better advisor for you but most important 98 percent of the clients who want to stay retired do stay retired and that's the most important thing because people come to me because they want to achieve financial freedom I can't guarantee results but I can guarantee you honesty integrity responsibility and dedication by paying attention to you and paying attention to what's going on in the world around us so thank you very much if you have any questions you can reach me on Twitter Facebook you can call the office obviously past performance is not indicative of future results come on over to wealthpilgrim.com and sign up for the free newsletter let me know how it can help I wish you nothing but success and um, yeah I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions that I can answer thanks again For more great ideas on how to have no money worries no matter what, come on over to WealthPilgrim.com, sign up for your free weekly updates, and get a free e-course on how to make better investments.